It's my great pleasure to join you today at the Riga Graduate School of Law. I'm sorry that it can't be a physical visit. I'd like to have been with you, but of course the COVID rules have made that impossible and instead I'm in a small studio in Vienna. I have been to Riga 10 years ago. I visited the Graduate School of Law and I had the bad luck to be there when the Icelandic ash cloud descended. That meant, and this was the pleasure of course, that instead of spending a night or two in Riga, I spent basically a whole week. That was a week that's very memorable for me. I got to know the city a little bit. I, I toured the streets, I visited the museums. And one of the abiding memories I've taken away, apart from the beauty of the city, is the extent to which the scars of war are still visible. I saw that on streets, but I also saw it by visiting museums and seeing the very well-told stories of atrocity after atrocity inflicted on the territory. I was reminded that the Second World War was an epoch-changing event in the history of our continent. Its horrors, its atrocities triggered the building of a new Europe, a Europe grounded in democracy, rule of law, at the very heart of which, the guarantor of which, is the promotion and protection of human rights. That commitment to rights at the heart of democracy has been in the story from the beginning. You see it in the United Nations Charter. We see it, of course, in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, with its so moving and powerful Article 1, all people are born free and equal in dignity and in rights, and we see it in the construction of treaties that emerged in the following decades. The treaties, the human rights treaties of the United Nations, but also the regional treaties, including here in Europe. The crown jewel of which, of course, is the European Convention on Human Rights. Here in Europe, within the EU, we also see the same story played out. An ever increasingly rights-based, rights-committed institution with, at its heart, the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, which celebrates the 20th anniversary of its negotiation just this year. We've achieved so much that already back in 1979, Pope John Paul II was able to say at the UN General Assembly that human rights is modernity's greatest achievement. Now, human rights may be our greatest achievement, but never has any achievement been put under more pressure are more threat than the system of human rights. Throughout its history, uh, the levels of abuse have been intolerable and unacceptable. However, in the last decade, I would suggest, things have somehow got worse. The levels of abuse have carried on, but with them, we have seen a willingness by some, including people in high office, to repudiate the system, to say, if human rights gets in my way, then human rights gets out of the way. All of this came to a head in 2020 with the COVID pandemic. Uh, we have never seen a greater, more widespread assault on human rights than is the case right now, not just, of course, in Europe, but right across the world. Perhaps most dramatically and disturbingly of all in 2020, the inequalities of our society have been laid bare. We now see in a way that is full centre, that is undeniable, the extent to which our societies are deeply unfair. Look at the situation of Roma. Some six million Roma living in the European Union. They are in 2020 experiencing a perfect storm of human rights abuse and deprivation. Look at the situation of Jews, a considerable number of whom say things are so bad that they want to emigrate. Look at the issue of migrants, those seeking asylum and how we treat them at our external borders. So we're in a moment of crisis, but let's use this moment of crisis as an opportunity for renewal. Let's grab 2020 uh, so that we can rebuild uh, our Europe, so that again, human rights is its beating heart. I would suggest three things. In the first place, we need to recommit uh, to the culture of human and fundamental rights. And one of the ways in which we can do that is through the upcoming Conference on the Future of Europe. Because perhaps of COVID, we don't hear so much of it. But when that conference rolls out in the coming months and into next year, it, will, it should be of epochal significance. And it can be such if we make it such. Second, we have to invest in ever-strengthening the architecture 
for the protection of human rights. Two things here. The first is, I keep an eye on the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, the EU entity that I have the honour to direct. I, it can play a bigger, deeper, more impactful role within our societies. And again, it can only do that in partnership with the legal community and with all those who care passionately about human rights and about democracy. But the second dimension of the architecture that I would mention today are the interesting initiatives in the European Union, such as, for example, to strengthen the oversight of rule of law, on the other hand, and to make the disbursement of EU funds dependent on respect for fundamental rights, on the other. Now, all of these developments are very much still growing and embedding themselves. Let's watch them, let's engage with them to make sure that they land to the best possible effect. And then the third and the final dimension of reinvigorating our commitment is recommitting ourselves passionately and, 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 and full square in respect for, in standing up for the rights of the most vulnerable in our societies. We are only as good as, our human rights systems are only as effective as, our democracy is only as true as its willingness, its ability and its engagement in standing up for those most at the edges of our societies. I thank you and I wish you all the best for the conclusion of this event and in your work. Good afternoon to uh, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to open this third panel of our conference, which will be focused on importance of human rights for a democratic society. I think that there is no best way to open uh, this panel than listening to Professor O'Flaherty, who is always uh, such uh, an interesting uh, source of uh, inspiration. And the idea that uh, he stresses that uh, probably human rights are uh, modernity greatest achievement, I think is uh, the best starting point for us uh, in order to introduce uh, this uh, panel. Also in this panel today, we have three uh, outstanding uh, speakers. I'm really very honored to have you on board uh, for this uh, conference. I will introduce them and then without, with no hesitation, give them the floor for uh, their presentation. Uh, we have a uh, uh, Judge Professor Ineta uh, Tiemele in our uh, panel, who is uh, a very well known uh, worldwide, but also for a GSL because he's, she's one of our uh, professors. She currently is uh, a judge uh, at the Court of Justice of the European Union. And she has a tremendous uh, experience both in the academic field, but also if I may use this word as a practitioner, as a judge, because she previously sat also in Strasbourg as a judge at the European Court uh, of Human Rights and has also been uh, the head of the Constitutional uh, Court of the Republic of Latvia. Uh, the second presentation uh, will uh, be delivered by uh, Judge Jan uh, Zobek, uh, who uh, equally is a, a, a very experienced uh, lawyer with several, several years uh, of experience in the uh, judiciary, uh, in, in, in the European uh, judiciary. He has been, uh, uh, first of all, judge at different courts in Slovenia from 2008 until 2017. He sat also in Slovenian constitutional court, and now he is back to Slovenia Supreme Court. He's the author of a number of publications which focus not only on civil law and on civil procedural law, but also on uh, constitutional law and uh, human rights. And uh, last uh, but not least, uh, as a third speaker, we will have uh, Dilfusa Kurulova, who is currently working as a legal consultant uh, for uh, Uzbekistan with the International Commission of uh, Jurists. Uh, she specialized, and this makes her presentation of utmost interest for me, on economic, social, and cultural rights. And before uh, 
covering the current position. Uh, she has also been lecturing uh, international law uh, at different universities, has been working with, CIS, with society organizations and NGOs, and also international uh, organizations, including UNICEF and uh, ILO. So also this panel is uh, uh, extremely rich. Uh, I give uh, with no excitation the floor to the first speaker, uh, Professor uh, Ineta Tsiemele, uh, uh, and reminding that we should stick to presentation uh, which take between five, uh, sorry 10 and, and 15 minutes maximum. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, everyone. And uh, thank you to the uh, uh, rector of the RGSL for this uh, very kind uh, uh, presentation. And uh, also thank you to the uh, RGSL's uh, team uh, for putting together um, uh, a very important actually and uh, uh, also in terms of uh, contents, uh, uh, a very necessary uh, conference and debate uh, for the whole day uh, today. Um, I will try to uh, have uh, in my uh, up to 15 minutes uh, uh, talk, I will have to, uh, I'll try to have um, six to seven points and uh, uh, that I would like to share with you. And these points uh, are meant to build uh, into what we just heard from the director of the uh, Fundamental, Fundamental Rights Agency, uh, Mr. Flaherty, and uh, also they will build into uh, the previous panels uh, of uh, today's uh, conference. So the first point that I would like to uh, underline um, is indeed the following, that um, a European type of uh, uh, democracy is based in three foundational elements, and we just heard them. So the three foundational elements are human rights, rule of law, and democracy. And uh, we have seen, uh, unfortunately, Time and again, uh, if we look at the history uh, of Europe, that uh, where one of the elements, one of the three elements becomes weak, the other two will follow. Uh, the other two are weakened uh, as well. And I would like simply to remind you that, in fact, the um, uh, interdependent and interrelated character between human rights, rule of law and democracy was uh, for the first time, and I should say finally, um, already uh, pointed out by the World Conference on Human Rights, which actually took place in Vienna in 1993. So uh, it is indeed uh, that um, uh, uh, the modern uh, uh, ideas, the history uh, of ideas has uh, uh, materialized, has come to recognize that these three ideas that do emanate from Europe, from the Western uh, sort of cultural hemisphere, uh, rule of law, human rights and democracy, that uh, they uh, cannot exist uh, one uh, without the other. Um, my next point is uh, that these three uh, uh, foundational uh, elements uh, of our uh, European culture, um, that they are also uh, the necessary basis for competitive uh, economy and that they are necessary for uh, general uh, prosperity. And so this is actually what the previous uh, two panels uh, have been addressing. And here I would like to link in and to say you can't have uh, uh, economy uh, uh, and prosperity unless uh, you ensure the protection of human rights within a democratic uh, discourse and uh, um, delimited by rule of law. Now, the, the third point that I would like to make is that uh, the reason uh, for uh, the, this worldview that we share uh, in Europe is actually the understanding of the nature of a human being. And uh, at the center of the uh, protection, of the idea of protection of human rights, a rule of law 
and democracy is the understanding that a human being is born free and equal in dignity and rights. And indeed, me too, I would like to emphasize and refer back to Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which uh, uh, in concentrates um, uh, the achievements uh, of, uh, of the development uh, of, of modern ideas. And I would also like to point out that uh, indeed 20 years ago, the uh, 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 Fundamental Rights Charter of the European Union in Articles 1 and Article 6 equally emphasize the human dignity and human freedom. Now, um, why uh, uh, it is important to recognize the freedom of a human being and equality of a human, uh, uh, human being as well as uh, dignity, well, the reason is that uh, uh, such a person uh, who can function within a legitimate, transparent and safe environment, I mean, knowing the rules of the game, so to say, uh, which is what the rule of law provides, uh, that's the main uh, driving force uh, behind a, uh, an economy. Um, in a, in a long-term perspective, uh, the best way to ensure uh, that there is an active economy is to ensure that individual rights uh, are protected. Now, uh, this is attested, and that's my fifth point. Uh, in fact, uh, interestingly, this is attested by the development of the case law, for example, of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Because we do know that historically, European communities uh, and now European Union stems from uh, uh, the interest to have common internal market and to, in fact, harmonize the policies and the actions in the area of economic cooperation. This was not uh, 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 an institution or a type of cooperation that emerged necessarily for the protection of fundamental rights. There we had the Council of Europe, the European Convention on Human Rights and the Court of European Court of Human Rights. But what we see is uh, the way the case law of the Court of Justice over the decades uh, has developed, we can see that, in fact, the four fundamental freedoms that are meant to be economic in nature, such as freedom of movement of goods and services and capital and freedom of movement of labor, could not be uh, properly exercised unless and until uh, the relevance of fundamental rights, of human rights, was acknowledged, was seen, and was linked into that legal order. And for example, what we have seen over the uh, recent years in the uh, jurisprudence of the Court of Justice with the cases uh, such as uh, Egenberger case uh, C-414-16 or uh, SM case C-129-18 or just recently a case that emerged from within Latvia because the Supreme Court asked uh, for the clarification of the applicable regulation and the applicable directive in the field of the protection of health in the case C 243-19A case. In all of these cases, what the Court of Justice has done in, in fact, interpreting the secondary legislation of the European Union, either in the field of uh, labor law or in the field of the protection of health with the transboundary uh, elements where our people are going to get a uh, health service in a neighboring country, or for example, uh, in the field of uh, freedom of movement of labor, where it happens that this family of the citizens of the European Union have adopted a have um, adopted a child in accordance in a third country in accordance with that country's customs. So in all of these uh, cases, we see that the Court of Justice 
has found it relevant to apply articles of the Fundamental Rights Charter and to explain uh, the provisions of the either directive or a regulation in the light of various articles of the Fundamental Rights Charter, be the articles on equal rights, Article 20, 21, be the articles on the freedom of religion. So you see that uh, what had actually historically emerged as an interest of economic cooperation has also come to realize that economic prosperity, economic cooperation cannot uh, properly be ensured unless and until fundamental rights are protected in these labor relations or in the movement of, uh, of goods, services or labor. And my sixth point is uh, it concerns also the uh, most recent uh, case law of the Latvian Constitutional Court, um, because the point can be made when the courts uh, upheld uh, fundamental rights, and especially if those are the rights in the field of social and economic rights, uh, there, uh, the states may often say, well, that is expensive to maintain social rights, to provide for social protection, to provide for social benefits. But even, for example, if you look at freedom of religion and to make sure that the family of the citizens of the European Union could stay together or to make sure that uh, you can get a job, even if you do not belong to a particular church or particular religious belief. Now, all of these instances, there the argument can be made. Well, I mean, it's either expensive or we are not very sure that uh, this is really how far the fundamental rights, for example, reach. Now, the Latvian Constitutional Court in 2020 had adjudicated on multiple cases in the field of social rights and social protection, starting with the first case on the guaranteed uh, minimum income for every uh, 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 individual residing uh, in Latvia. And that's a starting point in social rights. What is the minimum income that the state should provide, that there should be a provision in the state so that the person is somehow able to cater uh, for his or her life in, a, uh, in at least in a basic, uh, uh, dignified manner, and the Constitutional Court pronounced on it. Now, I should say the following. Of course, the case law, especially um, uh, in the field of social rights, brings about uh, considerable uh, uh, expenses uh, on the state budget. But, and it might seem that it is not uh, economically sort of uh, um, particularly uh, um, you know, easy to, to uh, implement social rights uh, in the country. However, uh, here again, I would come back to where I started. In fact, um, the very nature of human rights uh, is to empower every one of us every individual and uh, it is only when individuals feel empowered that uh, individuals we all are ready to act and to be creative and it is this the crux of the human rights idea because we really the entire uh, economic prosperity relies on individual creativity and action. And this is where uh, the connection between all of these elements in fact lies. So we need uh, a secure, creative and active individual, which is the driving force behind the economy and therefore the prosperity. And so indeed, as I started saying, everything is interrelated and interdependent. And with this, I, I stop my, my, my few comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ineta, for this uh, uh, 
brilliant presentation. I don't know how you managed to say so much only within 15 minutes. And um, what I find extremely interesting also for our conference is the, that you really linked the three panels around which the conference is articulated within a single speech and presentation. But we will uh, get back to the topical issues you are referred to during the Q&A session. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased now to give the floor to uh, uh, Judge Jan Jobek. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. And many thanks to Rector for inviting me, giving me opportunity to speak here. And uh, many thanks for a kind presentation. I will outline um, some drawbacks of um, post socialist judiciaries, mostly Slovenian judiciary, um, because uh, judiciary, judges, courts are guardians of the rule of law, guardians of human rights, uh, and then also guardians of democracy. So um, I will first um, go to the to the past to the times of uh, fall of uh, communism when the model of united power referred to also as dictatorship of proletariat was swiftly replaced by the system of separation of powers um, and uh, judici judiciary slovenian judiciary and others also from Central and Eastern Europe uh, has been recognized as the third branch and hence given dependence almost overnight. And uh, they were unprepared on such uh, tectonic change. Um, so what happened next? Um, the vast majority um, the vast majority of post-communist countries could not rely on colonization of judicial sector. Um, the bodies of uh, judiciary were simply transfer um, transferred from the old communist um, setting to the new legal framework. Only in East Germany in Eastern lands, in Germany, more than 90% of all judges were replaced by the Westerns. So together with judges, also the main traits, or the, the whole old traits of uh, judicial subculture, judicial behavior, uh, ideology, uh, was transformed into the new legal setting. So, Mm, let's see what are the main traits of uh, both socialists or socialist judiciaries. First, hyper-positivism. It's an extreme version of classical positivism mixed with the elements of uh, Soviet-style Marxism-Leninism. Then the gui guidelines of the Supreme Court. Then the understanding of law, what counts as law and what does not. Then the concept of interpretation, judicial ideology, what are functions of judges when deciding cases, and degree of formalism, as I mentioned before. Um, and uh, a Slovenian example in this um, time or in, uh, in transition was specific. During the whole transition period, with the only exemption, exemption of four, five years, the Slovenian government remains firmly in the hands of direct successors of the old regime party. And most of Slovenian subsistence remain also under control of the ancient regime, media, academia, education, justice, banking system, health system. 
Unlike Poland, Hungary, Czechia, and other Central European countries, Slovenia has not introduced any prohibition for former officials of the totalitarian regime uh, accessing public functions in the executive and legislative branches. And no prohibitions have been imposed even for the um, former uh, members of uh, agents of the form of the um, secret police. Only judiciary should have gone uh, undergone uh, illustration. Um, Judicial Service Act provided that judges who adjudicated um, in proceedings in which human rights were violated by judgment do not fulfill the conditions for re-elections to the permanent term in office. However, um, an expert evaluation of the judges' work was decisive for the granting of a permanent term in office, which means that judges evaluated themselves. And here, um, phenomena, as Adam Podgorecki has depicted, dirty togetherness came to the fore. Uh, none of uh, judges was denied uh, permanent term of office. So, um, and if we, if one couple um, this, um, observations with the Slovenian post-communist economic mo model, which was based on the philosophy of gradualism uh, closed to foreign investors, mean that half of the economy has been state-owned and therefore run by the government in power, while the other half was privatized by the insiders close to the very same government. Then you can um, understand in this context um, Professor Krieger's caveat um, about judicial independence. Judicial independence, he claimed, is not, in it's, is, not, is not of itself necessarily, and certainly it's not adequate to what we want from the rule of law. Sometimes it's even contradictory to the rule of law. Um, why? Because the first step in democratization of uh, the state was render judiciary independent, give them statutory self-organization. What's logical step in democracy? Because judges who are mm, guardians of the rule of law should be independent. Only independent judges are mm, full are viable guardians of the rule of law. And then he continued, a week later you discover that all these crooks and thugs and incompetents and victims are and benefi beneficiaries of negative selections who are put there for that reason in the courts are irremovable. And um, this is exactly what happened in Slovenia. Um, the transition to a liberal democracy and the rule of law has taken place with the old personnel, born, raised, and trained in the totalitarian regime. And hence, it came as no surprise that authoritarian legal culture and the corresponding ethics of obedience um, remained preserved in the impenitent thought patterns of the old regime as a heritage of the totalitarian period and the collectivist and corporatist mentality. It's preserved there. And in an uh, autopoetic manner, it feeds and fertilizes itself mentally with values and ideological points of view through the very institutionally close nature of self-sufficiency. So, um, Slovenia and its judiciary have to a great extent already arrived to the spot where Polish and Hungarian autocrats strive to achieve. There are several examples and cases and um, the list um, can go 
on and on of the list of uh, miscarriages of justice, um, malpractices, dysfunctions, and so on. Uh, I don't, I, I'll not go into details. Um, younger scholars um, um, have written uh, tons of materials on this phenomenon. Let's mention just the case Patria, um, where the leader of opposition was convicted and sent to prison two years, two weeks before parliamentary elections, and uh, later constitutional court abrogated the court's judgment and remanded the case due to violation of the right to impartial judge and also due to violation of the principle of legality in criminal law. Um, but uh, what I want to uh, emphasize in this story here is that um, the problem of uh, judicial reforms is mm, always the same. Judicial reforms are always perceived as um, uh, interfering in judicial uh, independence. Uh, leg <clears throat> where legislature is interfering with judicial independence. But Slovenian um, situation calls for reforms. And uh, let's see how um, uh, how are the standings of Slovenian judiciary as regards um, uh, independence, as regards trust in judiciary, as regards um, uh, case law uh, of Strasbourg court and uh, judgment against Slovenia. So in uh, uh, the problem is that the members of the old communist guard are gradually leaving the scene. And it's not about uh, ideology, uh, but it's just how to skillfully deploy their economic and political power. And often they, they often enlist much younger cadre who then do work for the old police. Um, and uh, comparing Slovenia to uh, uh, Poland and uh, mm, Hungary uh, and autocratic legalism to Hungarian and Polish constitutional backsliding, it's a different story. Slovenia's model of de facto political and economic continuity with a pre-democratic system has permitted its elites to hold the control of the country without any open authoritarian tendencies capture the state and constitutional backsliding. Different than in Hungary and in Poland, where the political elite had to engage in an overt attack against the constitutional legal framework of the state in order to ensure their loyalist penetrating uh, essential institution. In Slovenia, those loyalists and this control of the economy perfectly legally on the basis of state ownership have existed for decades. So um, Slovenia is um, captured in some kind of vicious circle and the dynamic of political project in Slovenia is that opposite to that in Hungary and Poland. Rather than seeking a profound change in the society, the political agenda of the contemporary Slovenia new class is the preservation of status quo by all means. And this is situation which calls for deep um, reform, uh, reform that could be compared with the one which are uh, currently um, witnessing, we are currently witnessing in Slovakia. And at this point, I will, I will end and thank you for, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
Judge Solbeck, for your very insightful uh, presentation, which I'm sure will trigger a lot of questions also from uh, our uh, audience. And I'm glad to give uh, the floor now to our third panelist, uh, Ms. Uh, Kurolova. Uh, thank you very much. You have the floor. Um, thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to thank for inviting me. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure for me um, to be here and be at the same panel with the justices that uh, for me it's an honor um, to deliver the speech. So I will be uh, um, not um, going into the global um, human rights concept, but maybe I will be uh, giving a speech and making it very local, um, like how um, human rights is reflected in uh, our judiciary system, not only in Uzbekistan, but also in uh, Central Asia uh, states, because it's also important, uh, apart from uh, international human rights treaties um, and uh, international organizations, it's important how it's uh, implemented in national legislations, because this is how uh, governments ensure their obligations to their people and ensure the human rights. So before I go into the details, um, I would just reflect and, and remember the very recent case that happened in uh, Central Asia, um, the death of a uh, very prominent uh, human rights um, defender and journalist, uh, Azimjan Naskarov, who died in Kyrgyzstan because he was very vocal on human rights violations happened in Kyrgyzstan in 2010. He's a, a national of, of, of Uzbek nationality, but he was recording his um, uh, witnesses of uh, human rights violations happened in Osh and discrimination cases. However, the, ju the judiciary of Kyrgyz Republic um, convicted him to the prison and gave him life imprisonment without fair trial. Uh, many international organizations, including the EU and um, um, OHCHR and other organizations, they tried hard to confess and, and condemn the, um, you know, discharge this and, and make uh, Kyrgyzstan to overthink about the judgment and release the innocent person who just what he did is just a recording. However, it, it never happened. And the situation with the COVID and you know, um, very bad conditions in uh, prisons made uh, the, the person's life bad and he just died uh, this year in July. Um, but good thing is that his final wish, um, he, he wanted uh, to, back, to be back in Uzbekistan. So he burned in, in Uzbekistan by his family. So why I'm reflecting it, because it, uh, yesterday was a, um, the day of human rights and uh, we, a uh, small community in Uzbekistan, uh, we, ha we watched a few documentaries and one of the documentaries was about this person uh, who also shows that government sometimes um, you know, trying to say in global area that uh, we are ratifying human rights conventions, ratifying human rights uh, documents. However, in the national level, unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't work. So if we go to the topic of the conference, um, I will just show you the map. Um, I'm sure everyone uh, knows about it and, and maybe you have already visited our countries, but this is a map of Central Asia. Um, since we uh, for many years uh, was um, under the Soviet Union um, and all of our countries has the similarities or, or a common uh, legal background and legal system. So every single country has its own constitution that was adopted in different years, but most of the constitutions was adopted in 2000, 1992. Some, uh, some of the countries adopted in 2010, uh, especially in Kyrgyzstan after this um, big um, you know, turnover in the country. Um, so basically the each constitution of the countries uh, say that human rights are core for um, democracy in the country. They, each of the constitution of Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, they say that basic uh, or fundamental freedoms of uh, human rights has to be guaranteed by the countries, uh, by the states. Uh, only Turkmen constitution says that Turkmenistan has a neutrality and everyone has to respect this neutrality. So we all understand in what uh, conditions the neutrality has been 
declared by Turkmenistan. So it's not the neutrality that uh, is in Switzerland, but it's completely different uh, sense of neutrality. So in the legal context, we see that the uh, government of Central Asian states, they say we have a dualistic legal system, meaning that international treaties that have been ratified by the countries usually has a privilege uh, when it comes to the coalition of um, legal acts. However, in the reality, we see that um, usually governments are taking a monistic legal system where the uh, international treaties do not play a greater role in human rights cases. So um, it's becoming very visible uh, when it comes to uh, economic, social and cultural rights. I'm specializing on ESC rights in Uzbekistan and uh, ICJ has a big project on access to justice on ESC rights uh, for, more, for already three years. And working with the judiciary, with the Bar Association, with the Ministry of Justice, um, and with the civil society, we see that uh, most of these actors do not understand that EC uh, are not uh, guarantees by the constitution and by the government, but these are fundamental rights that people have a right uh, let's say to the uh, right to education, right to adequate housing, right to health, and etc. Because the constitution of Uzbekistan, let's say, or constitution of Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, they also say that uh, every single person uh, or every citizen of their country has a right to education, free um, primary education, or they have a right for um, free medical. Uh, assistance and treatment, but this is a, a this is very much preserved as a guarantee by the government and not the right. When an, the right is coming to the person, it means that they need to have a legal remedies. So the person whose rights are violated, they can actually go to the court. However, we see in the reality, for example, we um, I. I there is a Supreme Court in Uzbekistan and they have a beautiful website where we can search for cases. Unfortunately, not many cases are uploaded there. Um, but what I observe is that there is no single judgment on EC rights. So people cannot go and seek for the legal remedies for right to education and say, for example, there is no adequate schools uh, in my district or they cannot go and say there is no adequate medical uh, healthcare facilities um, because uh, this is preserved by the society, by the judiciary and by, you know, everyone that this is a, uh, this is a guarantee. And it's like, you have to say, be thankful for the government for providing it for free of charge. However, this is a, a, a completely different concept where the rights has to be equal to legal remedies. And, uh, if it, and if it's needed, then there should be a fair um, like compensation for that. However, we see that it's um, in most of the cases in Central Asian countries, it's not taking a place. So I will show you, um, if I may, um, another uh, screenshot um, or slide. Uh, where you can see the table, uh, I made it especially to illustrate um, how, where, and how many, um, let's say, EC related treaties have been adopted uh, by different countries in Central Asia. So you see that the basic fundamental uh, core human rights documents have been adopted by all countries, um, apart from uh, CRPD, because it's very new and um, only Uzbekistan uh, and Tajikistan are signatories for uh, conventional rights of people with disabilities and we are not, um, uh, ratif we didn't ratify it yet. However, is, if you can see that um, the Central Asian countries do not accept or do not, um, let's say, join the op optional protocols on individual cases, which is also limiting the human rights and limiting people to protect their rights in the global or international area, let's say, in international mechanisms. So as far as I know, there are um, 48 uh, cases to different treaty bodies uh, from Uzbekistan. Um, more cases from other countries, but less cases on Turkmenistan. And it's, uh, I think, understandable why we have less cases from Turkmenistan. But um, this also says that uh, not many people, especially civil society, aware of individual 
uh, mechanisms of applying to treaty bodies, or there is also lack of knowledge how to do it, where to go, and and is there any fair um, seek for justice? So um, I think I have a few more minutes, and and I will finish. So um, and if we are going to talk about the COVID and how it reflected, so I would say in one hand, uh, it's a great illustration of how institutions are working, especially ju judiciary work. So um, among Central Asian countries, only uh, two countries, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, adopted the law on uh, state emergency, which is um, officially giving the right to derogate and limit human rights. So it's according to ICCP, uh, Article 3 ICCPR or ICEC right. However, uh, only Kyrgyzstan um, declared and notified UN treaty bodies and international community on limitations and derogations of human rights, while the other countries, uh, including my country, did not adopt non uh, did not adopt um, any special act like uh, uh, law on state of emergency, nor the notification on derogation and limitations of human rights. And of course, this also made um, to limit uh, certain uh, human rights. And it also showed how the judiciary is not functional during the crisis. Uh, one of the examples is the introduction or criminalization of freedom of speech. Uh, like uh, there is a now criminal offense for spreading false information in Uzbekistan. So this is also one of the things that worsened the situation. It's not like, because again, the Supreme Court uh, is not issuing, for example, amicus brief or any other legal acts that will actually show and demonstrate uh, which uh, difficult cases can be adopted or, or, or how to uh, resolve difficult cases. For example, uh, false spreading of information because what is the false information and how, how to spread? Um, it, is it the posting online on Facebook with four people in your friends list is a spreading the information? Or if you have a thousands of people as your followers, this will be a spreading of false information. So there is no um, such an instrument uh, that will allow um, not only judiciary, uh, but also um, in human rights communities, uh, ordinary peoples to enjoy their human rights, uh, they enjoy their guarantees and uh, seek for the legal remedies in the country. So this is a similarities of all in, in all Central Asian countries. And, and um, unfortunately, uh, COVID showed that some of the institutions are not working. Um, on one hand, on the other hand, we see that judiciary quickly could switch to online, especially in Kazakhstan. It was notably how judges, you know, use these online technologies like uh, WhatsApp and Telegram uh, to manage uh, discussions and then uh, call parties for the trials. Of course, it's not safe, perhaps, but this was one of the reactions, fast reactions uh, to ensure human rights. So thank you so much. And I think um, I'll be ready for any questions if you have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kurolova, also for your inspiring presentation. I think that uh, uh, we have already on the table several topics from uh, which uh, we can draw uh, to trigger uh, the debate. We are also receiving questions from the audience. Uh, if you don't mind, I would like to start uh, um, asking the first question to the three uh, panelists. Uh, we have watched the video of Michael O'Flaherty, who was... Um, let's say, proposing his priorities uh, to strengthen, uh, fulfill, protect human rights in uh, the near uh, future. And he was referring to the need to strengthen human rights engagement and culture, the general architecture for the protection of human rights, and to prioritize uh, the human rights of the most vulnerable that sometimes do not really appear in the international agenda. Uh, I would like to, to, to ask you what you think of these uh, uh, three priorities and what would you be your uh, immediate uh, priorities? Thank you. Probably we, we should continue in the order of interventions, just uh, very quickly to react. Uh, well, it is uh, quite evident that uh, 
to focus on vulnerable uh, must be a priority. And the reason for that is uh, that it's a question of uh, equal rights, equal rights and opportunities. And the reason we have uh, states as mechanisms to ensure the protection of human rights is to, uh, in those cases where individuals are empowered and can uh, exercise their rights, you know, the state usually stays away, just it's a, it's a shell within, within which individuals do that. But then there will always be groups and individuals that need, need some uh, concerted and focused assistance so that they eventually are empowered. And, and that's what I was talking about. And yes, uh, the whole idea, the whole philosophy, for example, about equal rights and, and uh, in the field of uh, social and economic uh, uh, rights is about that. Uh, there are those vulnerable uh, groups that need uh, assistance. And of course, then we speak about, uh, you know, positive measures and, and uh, issues like that. Um, the Constitutional Court of Latvia happened to exactly focus this year on the vulnerable groups and, and last several judgments are exactly about that. Because in the end of the day, either through positive measures or through simply giving freedom, uh, what you do, you ensure uh, human dignity. And that's, uh, I mean, the safer the person, the more dignified the person is, uh, the better the, the space uh, sort of around him or her. Yes, uh, emphasis, focus on vulnerable groups, whether they are ethnic minorities, whether they are socially disadvantaged, whether we are talking about persons with disabilities, where there is a lot of work uh, to be done, it's evident. The, the, more, uh, the, the less equality there is within the society, the safer that society is, you know, and, and that, of course, is uh, uh, very necessary. But then, of course, also what um, a colleague um, speaking about the situation in Central Asia was saying, there is also a lot about education on what the rights are and, and how to protect them. And every state has gone through that. Uh, certainly the ones that transformed from socialist or communist regimes into democratic states. And we have also uh, quickly touched upon that because you have to change your mindset uh, also, you have to want to be independent, you know, you have to be able to claim your rights as well, including, you know, uh, equal rights. So that's roughly what, uh, how I would uh, comment on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ineta. Mm, if I, it's my turn now, probably. So I will also, I would also opt for um, priority, uh, priority to the most vulnerable and also to recommit to human rights. Um, but in, uh, but currently when uh, vaccination is um, on the way, I call also for um, considering um, the even uh, allocation and distribution of vaccination. And here um, in this, um, this issue is also connected with the problem of uh, compulsory vaccination. Uh, how to find a new balance between um, the rights and the public interest. Because here public interest is not uh, the governmental, the state interest. It's the interest of each individual and uh, community. Um, so, uh, how to cope with situation uh, when a part of population, let's say um, 50% uh, 
denies, uh, declines uh, vaccination. Um, how to cope with the problem of uh, side effects and uh, tort law. Um, so many, many questions are opened here. However, um, the COVID pandemics uh, will left a uh, huge impact on the law and on the, on the searching for the new balance between the public interest, who is now not, not the same as governmental uh, interests as usual was individual and the state, but individual and community. Uh, and the health of uh, pu public health, the health of children, old and vulnerable, who are mm, encapsulated in uh, in the term of uh, public, uh, in the notion of public interest. So the new balance will will have to search for the new balance. Thank you for. Thank you very much. Um, so I will not uh, repeat what uh, Justice Anata and Justice uh, Jan just said. So I will just continue maybe the, on the priorities. Of course, I'm in line with the um, with the thing that minorities has to be, um, you know, they have to be provided with a equal rights, um, maybe special uh, assistance and need as Justice Inata was uh, telling about. And I would, uh, um, in the realms of Central Asia, I would even say maybe people with disabilities, women and youth and children are the most vulnerable groups because of the high level of domestic violence, uh, low uh, level of education uh, and not accessible streets non-accessible um, healthcare facilities, and especially judiciary uh, in the country, uh, especially for people with disabilities, would put them in a very vulnerable situation uh, in connection with the COVID. And the second thing is about the protection of those who are vocal uh, for the rights of people, uh, of, like for uh, minorities. So it's especially um, with the spreading of hate speech um, because everyone is now using internet and it seems like uh, the ones who are vocal uh, in Central Asian countries, they in most cases are very much attacked uh, on online and um, you know the hate speech especially in our countries are uh, becoming common sense um, and most people would like to stay alone and do not even talk about the situation, what is going on on the ground. And the third is about the radicalization. You know that majority of population in Central Asia are Muslims. And because of the lack of trust to the government, the lack of trust to institutions um, during the COVID and, and severe lockdown, uh, we see that many people are searching uh, let's say, a peace and justice in, uh, in the religion. So this is also one of, the th one of the reasons why the society is dividing who are becoming more radical to um, religion and, and the rest are becoming more tolerant, let's say. So this is also a clash in the society that leads to hate speech as well. And this is also the one thing that is uh, creating another minorities uh, within the societies. So I think this would be um, my three highlights um, on providing uh, special assistance to minorities or related issues. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's of course impossible to avoid a question, a comprehensive question regarding uh, COVID. Uh, it has been mentioned in uh, every panel today. Uh, it's definitely not uh, uh, questioning the enjoyment only uh, of the freedom of movement, but its attack goes far beyond this in the realm of human rights. So I would like to ask the panelists, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, what are the uh, rights that are uh, mostly under attack during uh, the pandemic? Uh, and secondly, how can we monitor, we, I mean, citizens, uh, that our uh, rights are only limited to the 
a strictly necessary ex extent. We have about 15 minutes for our panel for still, and there are still a number of questions. So if I may ask uh, to, to um, have relatively short question, uh, answers. Thank you. Yes, very quickly. Um, uh, during the pandemics, what we saw, uh, the first real challenge was to make sure that the constitutional uh, bodies and that the division of powers and checks and balances are really uh, maintained to the uh, maximum degree possible. Because the first really guarantee of the proper protection of human rights namely that they are not restricted more than necessary, is that uh, despite the pandemics, all of the three branches of power can exercise their functions. And there, I mean, the parliament, of course, overseeing the government, which clearly becomes a focal point for decision uh, making, but the parliament has to function. And we are in the 21st century where that is possible. And the judiciary as well, because the judiciary should continue receiving actually the complaints about actual human rights violations. And uh, I must say the experience of Latvia was, given that Latvia is very strong in the IT sector, that the parliament very qu quickly turned uh, its work into the e-parliament and the, the courts, but especially the constitutional court, within a couple of weeks uh, was back to normal and ready to receive complaints about the legislation, uh, COVID-related legislation adopted, which evidently restricted the freedoms for reasons of public health. And so the second point is, it is crucial that there are courts uh, in place which know uh, the, the best practices in the human rights law, that the test is strict necessity, as the Human Rights Committee and the others have emphasized, that there are courts with this knowledge, including constitutional courts, and that are capable of carrying out the balance of, you know, the public interest and the restriction of individual rights in such circumstances. So that's a Latvian lesson, and I think that's a very important lesson, and, and I'm happy to, to say that I think Latvia has uh, done quite uh, quite well uh, in this field, but there are still cases pending in the Constitutional Court, which will say whether the balance was uh, rightly set uh, by the government and the parliament. Thank you. My turn now. Slovenia is uh, scoring high in uh, death toll and also in infections. We are on the top. But despite this fact, um, courts are, uh, courts are uh, exercising um, their duties uh, regularly, also constitutional court. Uh, we have um, sessions in person and hearings also in person. Uh, however, despite this fact, uh, th there are no, actually no um, infections within judiciary. Um, the Constitutional Court has already um, adjudicated um, a case on uh, lim limiting um, the uh, freedom of movement and freedom of assembly uh, found that uh, limitations were um, uh, in line with constitution and uh, uh, using uh, strict tests, not only reasonable basis tests, but strict tests and found it's um, all those limitations are in line with constitution. Thank you. Um, and again, just to continue the conversation and uh, what Justice Ineta said about the necessity uh, like of the restrictions, I would just stress on uh, um, the sunset clause of all restrictions that the governments are responsible or taking uh, in line with the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, so it should be when it's a proportional, necessary and non-discriminatory, uh, let's say restrictions, 
um, they also has to be uh, within the time frame. So they have to be gone after a certain period when it's not necessary anymore or it's not proportional. Uh, if we're talking about the death rates or COVID infections, Central Asia is not you know, in a high level by the official data, but in reality, we understand that the statistics are not clear enough and not fair perhaps. So um, I would just say um, these restrictions, uh, apart from freedom of movement, um, the limitation of freedom of movement, but it's also about the uh, limitation of uh, freedom of speech, limitation of right to health, right to education, um, uh, access to justice. These are basic fundamental ESA rights that has been limited during the COVID and, um, and taking the Article 3 of ICCPR or uh, ICCR, they have to be um, time, within the time limit, and uh, as a sunset clause said, they have to be gone after uh, when there is no necessity of uh, taking all limitations. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like now to give the floor to a question which comes from uh, our uh, audience, uh, and we get back to economic, social, and cultural rights, which were also previously mentioned by the panelists. The question is, how is, it, how is it possible to make sure that all EU countries have the same social rights for all members of society, especially, sorry, what are now referred to as non-traditional families? Uh, I, I repeat the question, sorry, probably there was a, a technical problem. How is it possible to make sure that all EU countries uh, guarantee the same social rights for all members of society, especially uh, with regard to non-traditional families? Uh, right. Well, <laughs> non-traditional families. I will come back to the basic point that uh, I uh, started with, and I always do, that every human being uh, is uh, equal in rights and dignity. And uh, what is traditional and non-traditional? I typically do not appreciate these labels. So everyone uh, has the right to a family, okay? Um, whichever way it happens in life, we are we, we all are uh, unique <laughs> and uh, our lives are unique and uh, everyone has the right to a family and if the family is in uh, need of assistance, uh, there the states have positive obligations to protect uh, families, whatever, you know, the particular circumstances of uh, the problem are. But uh, the point of departure is uh, every human being has the right to a number of human rights and they should be enjoyed on equal basis. Thanks, Ineta. It's almost the same in Slovenia. Uh, Article 14 of Slovenian constitution uh, provides that in Slovenia, everyone shall be guaranteed equal human rights and fundamental freedoms, irrespective of national region, race, sex, or other, or other uh, political or other conviction, material standing, birth, education, or any other personal circumstance. So no matter the type of family, be <clears throat> traditional or non-traditional, everyone shall be guaranteed equal human rights. So um, there is no place for discrimination under our constitution. Well, none of the Central Asian countries are part of the EU, but uh, all our constitution, um, I mean, Central Asian state constitution, they all say that there is no um, discrimination based on uh, gender, social status, or religion, and other uh, features, let's say. Um, so, and the all constitutions of Central Asia states, they say that they are civic and social states, meaning that social security is one of the priorities of the government that has been uh, provided to people even in not during the COVID pandemic. So I think it's uh, one of the legacies of Soviet Union that we had um, during the um, before the 1990s 
I am. Thank you very much. Um, a concept, uh, a, a powerful, uh, empowering concept, uh, which has been mentioned already within this panel, is the concept of human right to education. I think we all agree that it's functional to this uh, empowerment of individuals and to the enjoyment also of many other uh, rights. I would like to put uh, in the spotlight, human rights education in general. I mean, there's a lot of say about this, but to my best knowledge, I mean, there's not really so many initiatives. And it's a subject which is uh, uh, highly neglected sometimes also in school. I would like to ask the panelists, uh, what could be done uh, to strengthen uh, the right to human rights education? I agree with you. There is certainly a right to human rights education as part of the United Nations standards and has been as such for decades by now. And I'm somewhat uh, puzzled that um, the, the, this has not really been taken sufficiently seriously by, for example, whoever is responsible within the countries for the contents of curricula in the uh, uh, education establishments. But I would, and I had actually more than 20 years ago, um, still as the young uh, uh, lecturer at the Faculty of Law of the University of Latvia, I argued in favor of the course on uh, human rights, on human rights, um, not just at the law faculties, because the law faculties by now have that. We also have specialized master programs, and that has emerged over the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. But what is really needed, because the life has become very rapid and the children grow up very quickly. <laughs> so I would have said that we really do need a new subject in the schools where that is not yet done. And that's the human rights you know, education within schools, within general schools for the, for the certainly for the teenagers, for sure, um, if not younger ones. And, and human rights need to be taught either through the constitution perspective, through international human rights, you know, uh, treaties perspective. But that is uh, something that is very easily done. I know that the United Nations even has uh, had decades ago designed uh, a curricula, you know, for for such human rights education in, in, in schools, which we could all in fact take simply and and adapt, you know, in languages and cultural settings. But uh, I, I I could not agree more. It's a high time to do that. Thank you. Um, the COVID pandemics uh, showed how um, we are interdependent. We are all in mutual relations. We are dependent on each other. So um, the school programs should implement, as uh, Ineta mentioned, uh, human rights and uh, constitutionalism uh, subject and uh, enhancing um, the culture the, mm, and the conscience of constitutionality, human rights. Um, and in this way, probably um, the balance between, as I mentioned before, individualistic concept and egocentrism of uh, individuals will be somehow softened and uh, mm, uh, care also for the neighbor, for the other, will prevail and will be included in uh, one's uh, conscience and one's behavior. So maybe uh, the COVID pandemics will teach us in uh, this way, and giving, give us lesson from um, how to enhance our conscience that we are all in mutual relations, in interdependent. 
Well, apart from um, European countries, I believe um, in, in Central Asian countries, uh, the, as a, I guess, again, Soviet legacy, um, primarily education, uh, like uh, elementary education, they there is a courses on human rights, not uh, particularly it called a, it's a human right, but it calls a constitutional law or constitution of the uh, of certain country, for example, in schools, uh, in primary schools, on secondary schools in Uzbekistan, we call it Constitution of Republic of Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. And within this course during the semester, um, during the quarter, they study the Constitution of Republic of Uzbekistan. And within it, of course, they learn uh, basic human rights because the Constitution uh, already includes the human rights, uh, basic principles and uh, and the rights. Um, however, um, it's a one thing to have it. Uh, another thing is how deep and understandable is that? How practical is that? So the uh, inter uh, IC, uh, ICCR says the right to education and one of the elements of right to education is not about the accessibility, but is also about, I mean, the availability, but it's also about the quality and usability of this right. So how it's being taught that children with for example, understand that this is a human right, this is a, their rights, but not only the guarantees by the constitution. As I previously and, and started with telling it that whatever is written in the constitution of uh, Central Asian countries is not just the guarantees, but is the rights, the rights that can be protected and can be uh, and, and has a legal remedies uh, in the judiciary that you can seek for the justice uh, if your rights are violated. So this is a different approach. So um, if you tick the box of availability, yes, the Central Asian, all, all, almost all Central Asian countries has the basic uh, constitutional rights courses in the schools, so everyone knows it. However, if you go deeply and, and see the curriculum, what has been taught, what are the approaches, and do children really understand that this is their rights, then it's completely the thing that uh, perhaps the uh, not only international organizations but NGOs, uh, human rights organization defenders has to be has to write uh, has to work on that. So legal li literacy is also another thing um, that is um, you know in coming. Uh, not in formal uh, human rights education, but also as a part of informal education. So um, as a human rights lawyer in Uzbekistan, uh, for example, I think that this is my duty and obligation in front of the society. And uh, I provide free legal consultations to people uh, through online platforms. So this is the thing that I'm doing for almost three, almost two years as a pro bono. Um, and I see many cases that people just do not know their rights. They they know that there is a constitution, they know that there is a court, they know that they have a right, but they are not sure if they can be protected or if they can go actually to the court and seek for the remedies. So this is the, uh, the thing that I think we have to think about, not only formal education, but also uh, uh, um, uh, providing um, space for education, human rights education, uh, not only informal, but also informal uh, spaces. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we are slowly uh, approaching uh, the end uh, of the conference, unfortunately, and the moment of the final remarks. If I may ask a final question uh, to the panelists asking to reply, uh, really within uh, maximum uh, one, one minute. I was wondering, I mean, we are dealing with different contexts, uh, Western Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, Baltic countries, Central Asia. A common feature, I mean, all these areas have been going in the recent or a little bit more less recent past through severe and systematic human rights violation connected with conflicts or connecting with authoritarian uh, regime. And Judge Zobek was uh, highlighting that uh, I think at least the process of screening public servants or more comprehensively, the process of dealing with the past uh, in Slovenia has not been uh, accomplished to a full extent, which I think is a common ground in almost every country. I was just wondering how you think that, that dealing with the past of mass atrocities and human rights violation uh, can influence the respect of, of human rights for the future. Maybe it's a too long question for, for <laughs> the time available at the moment. 
Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Piero. Very quickly, um, Latvia too has a difficulty uh, as far as uh, any possible uh, illustration or uh, getting to terms uh, with the uh, uh, totalitarian traumas is concerned. And what we see is, um, I mean, unless you are able to talk about it freely and to address uh, the totalitarian traumas, it is very difficult to build the future. And it is very difficult in particular to recognize that everyone is dignified uh, as a human being and has the rights. And so I would say it is extremely important to come to terms, each one of us and as a society, to come to terms with the past. Of course, you are already you were asking about you know, prosecutions and adjudications of specific crimes, but the issue is broader because it's subconsciousness that actually has been affected of a human being and that really needs to be uh, healed in order to be able to properly implement democracy rule of law and human rights and it is difficult and it takes a very long time i absolutely agree what ineta just said. And um, I will only add that um, transitional justice entails um, rehabilitation of victims of uh, communist crimes, denationalization, uh, and uh, punishing uh, perpetrators of atrocities. Uh, in Slovenia, uh, denationalization has been carried out, also rehabilitation of the vic victims, but uh, not one perpetrator was brought before the court. Despite the fact that uh, Slovenia is a country of uh, the, the most uh, horrible atrocities which uh, took place after the Second World War more than uh, 10 hundred thousand were killed murdered and they even um, don't deserve until now uh, the right to the grave so they they, they were buried in uh, mine shafts uh, and elsewhere so it's a kind of uh, burden which is still um, on, uh, on Slovenian population and for further genera generation and until this will be exonerated um, and justice and traditional justice will be uh, carried out, uh, we'll, we'll have uh, problems with judiciary, human rights, and there will be no peace in Slovenia, at least no peace in individuals. Thank you. Um, perhaps I will be very optimistic on uh, how COVID can actually boost uh, the human rights protections because um, um, taking into consideration past of Central Asian countries and how and what is the approach of the government to human rights, I would say the COVID was ideal uh, conditions for the states uh, to, um, you know, um, open the Levi Leviathan of the country. So to push forward the limitations and, and take the power over the uh, certain elite groups. However, uh, this also strict uh, restrictions showed that people are have more tendency for radicalization and uh, to go beyond the security issue and security of the region and the countries. That's why I think now after the more than uh, seven and uh, eight months of the lockdown in Central Asian countries, I think the governments and, and politicians a little bit understood that people actually have a power to go out or um, to go beyond um, the, let's say, legal framework uh, of these states. And I think um, the politicians and the government, especially of Central Asian states, would a little bit think um, that perhaps this is the time 
to meet, respect, and protect human rights, and especially um, to fulfill international obligations on human rights by the states, because uh, Central Asian countries are not, uh, unfortunately, um, having a good track record on human rights uh, protection. But, so I, I'm very optimistic on that, and I hope um, this is this the cr the crisis will show um, that every human rights dignity. Um, has to be protected and guaranteed by the countries. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now I would like um, to thank the panelists for their very inspiring contribution. Personally, I'm extremely sorry that we have to stop the discussion uh, at this moment because I feel that there would be so much still to debate uh, together and with our international audience. And uh, I anticipate, I mean, uh, I really hope that RGSL will be able in the near future, together in partnership with the uh, Latvian and Norwegian government to organize uh, a similar uh, event. So thank you very much uh, to the uh, panelists. I'm sure that our dialogue will go on.